to talk about uh, some new Python tools that uh, Jesse and I have been developing. I guess this started off as our COVID year project, uh, put the pandemic to some good use, uh, but it's already got quite a bit of interest. We know there are people around the world already using it for teaching, but we particularly think it's got really strong applicability to uh, reproducible robotics research. So I think reproducible research has some really special requirements. I'd say quite strong requirements for the tools that we use. Uh, I think it needs to be accessible to everybody. I'm uh, not proprietary, it needs to be open, but open source software isn't perfect either. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. We need tools that are gonna be there in 20 years time. And that's actually quite a, quite a strong ask. Uh, there's not a lot of software that, that lasts uh, that long and runs code from, from that long ago. <clears throat> I would think that it needs to be very well engineered. Uh, I would argue very strongly that it has, needs to have minimal dependencies because for me in an open source project, every dependency is a point of fatal weakness. All right, if that uh, dependency uh, breaks, is no longer maintained, then you've got a lot of work to do to re-engineer your, your tools to uh, work around that change. And dependencies can also tie you to outdated languages or operating systems. And many of us have seen this with ROS, which ties you to particular, a uh, very small number of versions of Ubuntu. Uh, and until very recently, it tied you to using Python 2, which is now an obsolete language. The uh, final requirement is that it needs to be well documented. So these are, are quite tight requirements. <clears throat> also say that there's actually no shortage of software for robotics. There's tons of it there, uh, written in all sorts of different languages. A lot of it's free. Not a lot of it is complete or well documented or well tested or portable or easy to install. <clears throat> and I think that's a problem for, for users. Sometimes if it's just too hard to use tools that are out there, then people think, oh, how hard can it be? I'll write my own. And then we just have this proliferation of software, which is perhaps not well designed, done in a hurry, never, not finished, not documented. And I think that's why we see the plethora of, of, of tools in the world, because there aren't the, the, the good examples to, to take and use. A thing I feel really strongly about is what I call craft. Uh, and craft these unnecessarily complicated uh, tools and software. And so on the right, there are two examples. Like this is Ross, I want to set the velocity of a robot. And I have to write all those lines of code in Python. And that's just nuts. I want to write three lines of Python, uh, which are down there on the, in the very bottom right, right? So uh, I think we need to create tools that are expressive and concise and don't have more lines than they need to do. I think my colleagues are sick of hearing me say, how can I do this in five lines of code? So I think if you can't do it in five lines of code, I think for every line after five, you lose half your audience, right? <laughs> that's, that's my theory. <clears throat> so open source code is not without issues, as I mentioned earlier. I think open source software can be part of the solution, but it can also actually be part of the problem. Uh, and I'm a big fan of open source software, but uh, there are issues. Breaking changes where people make a change because it makes the software tidier or nicer, but it hurts all the people who've depended on it. Projects that are maintained for a while and then they lose, that, the energy goes out of it, they become unmaintained and eventually they become inoperable. <clears throat> Another thing that's interesting to me lately is that some open source software actually has licensing complexity. So a particular example would be OrbSlam uh, out of Zaragoza. And a lot of people think it's open source software and it is for research, but if you want to use it in a product, you've got to go and talk to the university and license it. And so sometimes people start with a particular belief about a license condition and then are surprised that actually it's not as simple as they thought uh, that it would be. So some of the issues. So I'm going to talk about software, uh, the robotics toolbox for soft, uh, robotics toolbox for MATLAB, uh, which I've been maintaining for over 25 years now. Uh, it's changed a lot over time because MATLAB's changed a lot over time, and I've my interest in robotics have changed over time. So both those two pressures have caused the software to change over time, uh, and. It's been uh, used in a uh, textbook by John Craig, 
and in my own my own textbook, uh, which is now in the second edition. And this is all in MATLAB so far, but really starting from 2020, we've re-engineered the toolbox in Python. Uh, a large amount of the work was done by Jesse. And we took the opportunity not just to do a strict port because the languages are different and we wanted to make it as Pythonic as possible. That you'd express things in a way that a Python programmer would respect. Uh, but we wanted to keep some of the backward compatibility. So there's quite a bit of design work uh, went into it. So now going forward, it is just a robotics toolbox and there's a Python branch and there is a MATLAB branch. Uh, I think I will still be maintaining the MATLAB version for a few more years yet, uh, though I would rather not uh, be trying to do that as well. So advantages of Python. Many of you probably know this third most popular programming language on the planet. It's free and there is just this enormous ecosystem of really good quality tools, fantastic IDEs, linear algebra uh, packages, uh, advanced algorithmic tools like SciPy with optimization, integration, great graphics. It's a modern language. And to me, what I like about it is it's concise. It is free of cruft. So I can write things in a few lines of Python that would probably be you know, 20 lines of Java or 30 lines of C++. Uh, I can write it very concisely. And on the bottom right there are just some of the tools that we've leveraged uh, in, in our work. Uh, so it's also very scalable. You can run Python on supercomputers. You can run it on the smallest of embedded computers now with MicroPython. A Raspberry Pi, for instance, you can run Python on that very nicely. Uh, MATLAB on a device that scale, not so much. So I'm going to talk uh, quickly through a family of open Python tools for robotics. And there's five of them at the moment. Uh, and I'll go through them. Uh, the first four, uh, one by one. And then Jesse is going to talk about Swift, uh, which is a wonderful graphical simulator and he's going to talk to us about what he can do with that. So these Python toolboxes are maturing. Uh, they've been out really for a year and we've got a, a reasonable user base at this point. It is now sufficiently advanced that I am rewriting my book uh, to use Python. So here are two pages, uh, the edition two uh, in the middle column here, and the edition three here. So you can see this is all lines of Python code. The figures are more or less more or less the same. Uh, I've taken the opportunity to make lots of other changes as well to the book, uh, but I have uh, eight chapters now complete and being reviewed by colleagues and the rest are on the way. Hopefully it will be available middle, second half of next year is what I'm looking at. So it is it is getting mature uh, and that makes me happy. I never thought I would live long enough to do this book in Python, uh, but it's all come together in quite a hurry. It makes me happy. So spatial math toolbox of Python. Um, if you do robotics, you need to deal with particular data types. You need to deal with rotation matrices, homogeneous transformation matrices, roll pitch your angles and all these sorts of things. Uh, and, two-dimensional rotation matrices as well. So there's a bunch of Python functions that mirror what I had in MATLAB that create NumPy arrays or NumPy vectors that do all these sorts of functions. They've got the same names actually as the, as the MATLAB functions. <clears throat> so it makes it quite easy to port code. So if you want to create a, uh, an, an SO3 matrix, rotation around the z-axis, you know, that's your function there. Or if you want to make roll pick make a transformation matrix from Euler angles, you know, that's your function there. So uh, that's just a strict port. And there's a bunch of functions have been added to do things like uh, logarithms and uh, exponentiation of uh, SE3 matrices and SO3 matrices and deal with skew symmetric matrices. But what sort of frustrates me a little bit is that there's not type safety when you're just working with native arrays, whether that's in MATLAB or whether it's in, uh, in Python with NumPy. You've got a three by three array, uh, but it doesn't mean that necessarily you can compose them, right? You can only compose SO3 matrices or SE2 matrices that are three by three. And there's no type checking of what the matrix means. It's just a three by three matrix, but we've, we've lost some semantic information that's associated with that matrix. And I really wanted to add that. And classes are the natural way to do that. So we've created a bunch of classes. 
So there's an SE3 class, which is an instance of an SE3 matrix. And because the matrix is encapsulated, it's guaranteed to always contain an SE, a valid SE3 matrix. You can't put any other sort of matrix in there. It has to be within the group. And the same for, for twists and, uh, and rotation matrices and quaternions and Pluca lines and things like that. There's a family uh, of classes that encapsulate uh, these mathematical objects. <clears throat> a lot of these classes have got very standard sorts of what look like constructors. In Python, they're class methods, but they look like constructors. So I can construct an SO3 matrix or an SE3 matrix or a unit quaternion or a twist uh, that's a pure rotation about the x-axis, they all have a dot rx constructor. And they all have an Euler angle constructor or an angle vector constructor or a random value constructor. Uh, so they're actually quite polymorphic. So you could build an application that used <coughs> SO3 rotation matrices. And then with a few changes, you could make it so that it worked with unit quaternions instead because the methods of the objects are largely, largely the same and many other prop common properties and methods. And operator overloading is there, uh, so you can multiply them you know, if that's an appropriate thing to do. So then the issue comes about how do you deal with trajectories? Let's say I've got a whole lot of uh, transforms which represent link frames on a robot or uh, frames along a trajectory. You could have a list of those, uh, those objects, or you could make a three-dimensional stack of those objects if they were just NumPy arrays. What I chose to do was to make them inherit from the Python list class. So an SE3 object can have just one matrix in it, or it can have a whole bunch of matrices in it. Uh, it's got the length, the length method uh, can be applied to it. It tells me in this case that it's got four SE3 matrices within it. And then I can iterate over it, or I can use it in a comprehension. I can insert, pop, delete, all the things you can do with a list I can do with an SE3 object, which is very powerful. <clears throat> And I can broadcast them together. So if I brought a multiply an SE3 object with one element by one with four elements, it kind of is going to do the, the thing you'd expect it to do or hope that it would do, which is kind of helpful. Uh, I might skip that one. And we've got support for three-dimensional and two-dimensional twists uh, in the toolbox as well. And there's quite a complex class hierarchy. They all inherit from an abstract superclass, which gives them all list uh, list-like superpowers. There's also in the class hierarchy, a bunch of classes over here, which implement Roy Featherstone's uh, spatial vector notation. Uh, so we have spatial velocities, inertias, forces, velocities, and all those things implemented with Roy's, uh, Roy's mathematical notation. But a lot of the rules are in strictly enforced by, by these classes. Uh, it makes it very easy to code something like uh, Newton-Euler dynamics, uh, in Python based on these classes. It's very, very elegant. So that's the spatial maths which underpins the toolbox. The toolbox aim as always has been to be very concise. So we support robots defined with Denevit Hartenberg notation, uh, though I like Denevit Harten no Hartenberg notation less and less. Uh, we do support it. Uh, and we've got all sorts of operations, forward kinematics, inverse kinematics, manipulability, trajectories, provide a bunch of models. It's easy to create your own model. Uh, in, this is an example using DH notation. Just build a, a list of objects and, a construct, and construct a robot object. Once you've got a robot object, then there are tons of things you can do with it. We can import now URDF models directly uh, without any dependency on ROS. We can import URDF models, even if they have uh, Zacro macros in them. Uh, we've got a built-in Zacro preprocessor. So we can import and display and manipulate very complex models uh, like PR2 robot, for example. Uh, the animation there is Swift, which Jesse will show shortly. Uh, we can do all the dynamic stuff in, in joint space and operational space. Uh, there are some variations of inertia and gravity load with configuration. I might skip these things. Product of exponential notation is also supported for people who are fans of that and the toolbox interfaces in a fairly controlled way with uh, physical robots and graphical backends. And we can do symbolic stuff also, which is very useful for uh, many applications. I find myself using this a lot. And SymPy uh, is open and a wonderful symbolic manipulation tool. 
really quickly because I think I'm going over time. Um, block diagrams, I think, are a really important way to think about uh, engineered systems. And in my book, I use a lot of block diagrams. Uh, and there's an example of one here. And so there isn't a block diagram language or a tool like Simulink in the Python universe. So I thought, how hard would it, could it be to create a sort of Pythonic block diagram execution engine? And so here's a block diagram on the uh, over, over here. And this is its equivalent uh, using a package I wrote called BD Sim. So I define a bunch of blocks, I wire the blocks together, and I compile it, and then I run it. And over here, you see an animation of a mobile robot moving along a path to follow a line. And what it's the code in the middle, that's what's executing to generate this particular plot. So I'm pretty pleased with that. It's actually come quite a long way. It's usable now. Every example in my book, I can uh, I can implement this way. But I have to hand code, translate a graphical block diagram into Python code. So then I thought, how hard could it be to create a graphical front end? So I got some students uh, and they built this graphical front end, which is pretty cool. And so now in the book, uh, what I thought was the biggest risk factor, I've got a block diagram. This is a Khatib's operational space controller in Simulink and in my own package. Uh, and I get almost, I get pretty much the same simulation results. So that's pretty cool. So now Python has an open source block diagram execution and editing capability. Finally, uh, there's, a, there's a library of Python graph classes. Uh, gra mathematical graphs are important for lots of things. Uh, so this graph class uh, underpins path planning, PRM, RRT, lattice planners, uh, and various SLAM algorithms in the book. And these are some figures from the book which have been done using uh, this uh, graph library called pgraph. Uh, so it's a pretty capable mathematical graph library. Uh, again, that's open and free. So in summary, there's a bunch of new tools in Python that are very useful to roboticists. Uh, there's also a machine vision toolbox, but I haven't had a chance to talk about that today. Please give it a go. You can pip install uh, all of these things. Uh, you can also visit the, the GitHub sites. You can leave comments, send me pull requests. All of that's welcome. Uh, it's still early days. So please give it a go, send feedback, be kind. Uh, I'll stop there, thank you. And hand it over to Jesse. Thanks for that, Peter. Uh, let me just share my screen. Awesome. So I'm gonna give a bit of a kind of practical demonstration of what the toolbox can do and kind of show off what Swift brings to the table at the same time. Uh, so I'm going to start off by making a Panda model. Uh, so I simply uh, import the toolbox um, and then make a robot object called Panda. Uh, we can print the UIDF string of the Panda. Um, and this is a robot made using uh, UIDF, using the UIDF system. Uh, and here we have in the terminal um, the whole big ugly UIDF string that describes the Panda robot. Uh, and this isn't terribly useful. Uh, so the toolbox has its own uh, print method. So if I just print Panda itself, uh, what we get is this lovely description of the Panda here. Uh, so we can see it's an e robot, and e robots are constructed using. Um, so is my screen share still? No, working? it's not. You're not working. The last thing I can uh, now I can see it. Uh, yep. I might have accidentally paused that. Sorry, guys. Uh, so the panda is an e robot, which means it's being constructed using a UIDF file. Um, we can see that the panda is made by a Frank Emeka. It's got seven joints. All seven joints are revolute. Uh, we have the visual geometry of the robot and also the collision geometry. Uh, in this table here, we have the kinematic chain displayed in a table, um, and this is shown using Peter's ANSI table uh, Python package. Uh, and then finally, we have some named joint configurations. So QZ is the zero joint configuration, and QR is some predefined ready joint configuration. Uh, so the next thing we can do with a robot that might be useful is visualize it. So if you call the plot method on an e-robot, um, 
it will launch in Swift at some, um, how did that work? At some joint configuration you supply uh, to the method. So here we have the Panda in its zero joint configuration. Um, we should probably change that to QR, which is a much nicer joint configuration. And this block keyword argument just stops uh, the program from exiting, which would cause Swift to close. So as you can see, Swift launched in a browser tab. Uh, you can orbit around the robot and pan like any kind of 3D environment you might be familiar with already. So this is the most basic use of Swift that you could make. Um, in two lines, you've made a robot and you've visual visualized it. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is um, show this the kind of manual way. So we're going to import Swift. Uh, we're going to create a Swift instance. Uh, so we just call the Swift class and then tell Swift to launch. Uh, and then we're going to add the panda to the environment um, after we've made the panda. And then we're going to add this env.hold right at the end, which will stop the program from exiting, which would cause Swift to close. So if I kill that program, the Swift tab will close on its own in five seconds. So if we run this again, um, we'll get the panda in Swift once more. Um, and I'm going to set the joint angles of the panda to be the QR configuration. And this is the same result as we got with those two lines of code I showed you before. Just a more manual way, uh, but now we can do much more, much more amazing things from here. Uh, so from here, you might be interested in moving the robot. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna do is add the real-time um, keyword argument to the launch method. And what this will do is get Swift to run as close to real time as it can. Otherwise, it runs as quickly as possible. Uh, so the real time command is very useful for demonstrating things to other people, recording videos, so on. Uh, just like the robot has a dot Q attribute, which describes its joint coordinates, it's also got a dot QD, which describes the joint velocities of the robot. So by setting the first element of this array to be 0.1, that means that I want this joint here on the panda, the first joint, to rotate at 0.1 radians per second. Uh, now, if I run this, um, we will see that nothing happens. Uh, and that's because I haven't stepped the environment at all. So just like most simulators, you need to manually step the environment um, at a desired uh, time step, sorry. So the first argument to step is a DT. So by saying 0 0.05 seconds, um, every time I call env.step, uh, the simulator will use the robot's uh, joint velocities to calculate where it will be in 50 milliseconds. So I'm gonna do this a hundred times uh, and we will see Swift um, animate where the robot is at each time step. So you can see that first joint is now rotating and the panda is moving. Um, I can say, maybe make the end effector also rotate at 0.1 radians per second. Um, and then we'll see the end effector rotate as well. So that's, um, that's now getting into more basic usage of Swift. Uh, what if we want the robot to do something useful like get to some desired end effect of pose. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is import NumPy and also import spatial math. Um, then we're going to define some goal pose. So what I've made here is TEP, which is a variable um, which first calculates the forward kinematics of the panda using its current joint coordinates. Um, and this defines the end effector pose in the world frame. I then offset this pose 
um, in the, the x direction by 20 centimeters, and then offset that in the y direction by 20 centimeters, and then in the z direction by 35 centimeters. Uh, and we can visualize this pose in, um, in Swift by putting some axes in the environment. So the first thing we're going to need to do there is import spatial geometry, uh, which is another one of the toolboxes, many packages, uh, which defines basic shapes and meshes as well. So I've just defined a set of axes. These are right-handed coordinates. They have a length of 10 centimeters, and I've set their pose to be equal to TEP, which is the desired end effect of pose. Uh, I can then add them to the environment. Uh, and let's see what this looks like before we go any further. So you can see uh, these axes in the center of the Chrome tab now defines where I want the end effector to get to. Uh, so now we've just got to write the controller to get the end effector from where it is to where we want it to be. Uh, so I'm just going to make a couple of variables. First is an arrived flag, which will define when we've arrived, and also a time step. Uh, then I'll make a loop. So while we haven't arrived at our destination, um, and the first thing I'm going to do in this loop is use the toolbox's pservo method, uh, which returns the spatial error between one pose and another pose. So the first argument I'm passing in is the end effect of pose, which I'm calculating using the forward kinematics of the panda. Um, and the second pose I'm passing in is the desired pose. And so P servo will calculate the XYZ position and the roll pitch your position between these two poses um, and apply a gain. So if you increase the gain, um, the robot will try and get there faster. If you decrease the gain, it'll get there slower. And then the second number is the threshold for when it is deemed to arrive. So when the sum of the error, when the sum of the V reaches this amount, arrived will be true. Uh, the next thing I need to do is calculate the Jacobian of the robot in the end effector frame. So I do this using panda.jacobe. Um, I want the end effect of Jacobian because V is the spatial error in the end effect of reference frame. Um, and I pass in the robot's current joint coordinates. Um, and then I can work out the desired joint velocity of the robot by doing the pseudo inverse of the Jacobian and multiply that by the desired end effect of velocity. Uh, the last thing I'll do is step the environment. Uh, and now we have a complete controller, which will get our robot from some starting pose to a desired pose. And we can see our robot makes it there uh, nice and smoothly. If that was too fast, um, we can slow the robot down by 10 times. Uh, and we'll see the robot get there um, a bit slower this time. So that's a kind of complete end-to-end -end example of getting up and running with Swift. There's some other fun things we can do that I haven't shown yet. Um, a very useful thing I've found is setting the uh, robot opacity. So this makes each geometry within the robot's body somewhat transparent. So by setting it to 0 0.5, I've made it 50% transparent. Uh, and here we can see now I've got a semi-transparent robot. Uh, the robot also has collision geometry. Um, so if I set the robot opacity to zero and the collision opacity to one, now we will get just the collision geometry. And we can see that it's made up by spheres and cylinders. Uh, you can also view both at the same time. So maybe I want the collision geometry overlaid with the normal geometry. Uh, and there we go. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, some work we've been doing to improve 
the performance of the toolbox for key kinematic operations, uh, in particular Jacobians, Ford kinematics, and Hessians, and so on. So um, I've implemented some of the kinematic methods using C extensions and then wrapped them in Python. So JSLOW, which I've got first here, calculates the Jacobian um, using the normal Python implementation. And then in the second, um, in line eight with JFAST, I supply the fast equals true keyword. Um, and this will invoke the C extension instead and calculate the Jacobian using that. Uh, so if I print the results of those two Jacobians, you can see that they're both identical. So um, there's no cheating happening. They both work equally um, accurately. Uh, but the real benefit of the fast methods, uh, we'll see if we profile them. So in the slow method and the fast method, I calculate the corresponding Jacobian a thousand times. And then I use the C profile package um, to profile how quickly these things are running. So if we run this now, let's say. Uh, we can see that the Python implementation took 0.4 seconds to calculate 1,000 Jacobians. Uh, using the C extension, it happened in just 10, 11 milliseconds. So that is many, many times faster. Um, in that, calculating the actual Jacobian, we can see here uh, took cumulative six milliseconds. The rest of the time, is spent in Python overhead. Uh, so it's um, pretty confronting to see just how much benefit you can get by um, putting a lot of effort into the back end. Um, and uh, what Python does and doesn't do so well. Uh, if we look at the corresponding Jacob E call here, we can see most of the time was spent there, 0 0.408 seconds in Jacob E. Uh, so it's about uh, was that 440 times slower, 400 times slower uh, than the C extension. Uh, there's still a lot of work to go with uh, getting this up into where we want people to be able to use it, but it's a work in progress. Um, and hopefully we can get all the key uh, kinematics equations and dynamic equations as well um, written in C extensions, but with all the benefits of being wrapped in Python. Uh, the last thing I'll show you is um, some of the versatility that Swift brings to the table. Uh, so in this first example, I'll show you um, a robot doing a thing. So here we've got a mobile manipulator running a controller, uh, which I, which is based off something I submitted to RHEL a few weeks ago. So we can see the robot started facing forward, it turned around, and it got to some desired end effect of pose. Uh, now, if you want to show this in your paper, uh, you might be scratching your head. How do you how do you kind of show this and convey um, convey something meaningful to your readers? You know, you can't embed a video in a piece of paper yet. Um, so, the first thing I'm going to show you is something that Swift may be able to help you with. So, here when it loads. Oops, sorry, I ran the wrong one. Um, I've added five robots each at a different point along the trajectory that the robot performs uh, with an increasing amount of opacity. So we can see the, the beginning robot is very transparent and the last robot is fully opaque. And now you can take a screenshot of this and put it in the paper and it pretty accurately shows the trajectory the robot followed. Uh, the other thing I'll add here is that you can programmatically set the camera pose. Uh, so you can see that the camera jumped from where it was at the start. Um, and there's also a screenshot button. So you can take a screenshot of that. Um, and it's the full uh, resolution of what your browser is. So now you can kind of completely reproduce your images in your Python code uh, for figures in your paper. Um, and you can also record and take screenshots programmatically through the Swift API. 
Um, the last thing I'll show you is how Swift can be used to compare between, um, say, your work and previous work that the literature has defined. Uh, and this can be great for videos accompanying your paper. Uh, so here we have my controller running on the fully opaque robot, and then an example of prior work running on the semi-transparent robot. And so you can kind of overlay these two things to directly show the difference between what you've come up with um, and what is out there already. Uh, so that's all, all I had for my presentation. I think